we'll go ahead and get started with solar roofing best practices for shake slate and metal shingle roofs. My name is Jeff Spees. I'm the Senior Director of Policy for Quick Mount PV. And a little brief introduction to Quick Mount. We offer a broad range of flashed roof attachments for attaching solar racking systems to uh, just about every roof type with the exception of metal panel roofs like standing seam or through fastened corrugated metal panel roofs. Those uh, products we typically would refer to uh, our friends over at S5 in Colorado. They've got a wide range of attachments, but we've got attachments that work on asphalt shingle roofs, tile shake slate, metal shingle, low slope roofs, and a variety of other companion products, things like conduit mounts, penetration flashings, things of that nature. Some of our newer products include our tile replacement mount, which as you remove the tile to install the base mount that's flashed, uh, and integrated into the underlayment waterproofing. You then replace the tile that you removed with a form-fitting metal flashing, which yields you a color-matching tile that you can use for servicing broken tile elsewhere on the roof that is inevitable during an installation. It's available for S, W-shaped, and flat tile. We've also made this same flashing concept now available for our quick hook uh, and, and really any tile hook this would work with where you're going to be able to replace the concrete tile with this metal flashing and use that concrete tile to as a spare for repairs. We Our newest product is the L-mount that you see on screen. It is a lower cost, economical flash mount that gives you the benefit of that elevated water seal that Quick Mount is very much known for. So that helps position the vulnerable seal surface up out of the way of the water line, especially in those freeze thaw areas. Our Q box is a transition box that allows you to bring your PV cables into the box and then transition through an elevated water seal into the attic space to route your PV cables into the attic. So it's a, uh, been a well-received product since we introduced it a few months ago. Uh, we've also improved products like our, our existing or our largest selling shingle mount, which is the E-mount with that rectangular block that spaces the L-foot even further off the water line with a really clever, robust seal that lives its life down in a protected cavity that you see on the right there. And we've rounded the corners of that flashing and put in these cool alignment guide notches that make it a lot easier to install, faster to install, and no more sharp, sharp corners on the flashing. You can get any of our products by just clicking that green free sample button that you'll find on most of the product pages. I also want to mention that we've recently launched a podcast series my, hosted by myself and my co-worker Sue Stark where we address interesting topics for rooftop solar installers. Our most recent episode uh, discusses the new relaxed fire setbacks and pathways that are going into effect in California in July and in other states as the uh, latest version of fire building and residential code with those relaxed setbacks goes into effect around the country. We do have our mobile training center that's crisscrossing the country. If you're interested in having it come to your place of business, contact our sales department and we can try to get you on the schedule. My name is Jeff Spees. I'm the Senior Director of Policy for Quick Mount PV. I also serve as Secretary for NABCEP, the Solar Industry Certification Organization. I'm on the board of the California Solar Energy Industry Association, which just changed its name to the California Solar and Storage Association. So instead of being CALSIA, it will now be CUSIA, but uh, focusing on the same uh, work that it's always done in advocating on behalf of solar water heating, solar, PV, and, and obviously storage, which is a key companion to solar photovoltaic systems. So I do serve on the board of CALSIA or CUSIA, and I also chair the Codes and Standards Committee. Uh, I'm on the UL2703 Standard Technical Panel, which relates to rack-mounted PV systems, where I lead the task group on a very Hot topic of conversation, always bonding and grounding. My degree is mechanical engineering. 30 years I've been teaching good folks such as yourself on a wide range of electrical and mechanical technical subjects. I, in the solar industry over the past 11 years, have organized 
several of the largest technical training conferences ever held. Thousands have attended my trainings like this webinar that you're on today. I do a lot of speaking at trade shows and events and uh, authoring technical uh, articles for trade publications. At heart, though, I'm a solar technology fan. I really love the technology that I'm fortunate to work in the industry. And my own home system has been featured on the inside back cover of Solar Pro Magazine a few years ago because we had done some pretty cool things from an inverter perspective, but also a roofing perspective. And, you know, in the industry, when you make it into the top technical trade publication, it's certainly uh, something that you remember. But really what I'm most excited about the past several years have been involved in the making a documentary film about how the solar PV industry started, where we interviewed dozens of pioneers of the industry, like Richard Perez, founder of Home Power and Solar Pro magazines. Uh, and uh, sadly, Richard passed away a little bit more than a year ago at his homestead in Southern Oregon. But we interviewed him and, and dozens of others. We start with the story in the mid-1800s with a scientific discovery to the Bell Solar la uh, Battery that debuted in the 50s, the space program in the 60s, but focus on that colorful group of characters like David Katz, who brought that technology down from space into homes around the world. And in the production of the film, we interviewed about 50 more than 50 of the pioneers of the industry. So uh, we will be showing that film and industry events over the coming year. In fact, we have a special screening that's being organized by a really wonderful organization called NorCal Solar on March 1st in Walnut Creek, California. If interested, get in touch with NorCal Solar and uh, they do have tickets available right now. NABSEP continuing education credits are available for today's training. We'll get one credit if you participate for the full 60 minutes, six zero. Uh, you'll receive it within one to two weeks in an email, check your spam filter, that will have a copy of the PDF of the NABSEP certificate, as well as links to download this presentation and see the recorded presentation. Please do fill out the survey after the webinar. We read that carefully and do our best to continually improve the educational material. So with that said, we're going to jump into it. And I do want to, again, emphasize that uh, if you have any questions, post them to the question box. I see Patrick has a comment uh, about uh, finding the trust. And uh, in the, Patrick, I still haven't gotten clearance from the gentleman who's gotten the patent applied for. He was in the, um, there's a really cool new rafter finding tool that I mentioned in a previous webinar that Patrick, I think, is referencing. And um, uh, it likely will be available the first run in the next week or two based upon the gentleman who developed this tool. Once I have that and the clearance to make that known to folks, I'll incorporate it into future webinars. So uh, thanks for uh, asking the question, Patrick, and I'll keep you posted. So it's, a, it's, a, it's the neatest rafter finding tool that I've ever seen. <clears throat> and, and what I like about it is it's a very simple concept that is quite effective. So let's move on. Uh, I think folks need to appreciate that solar panels, and many people do recognize this, can last a very long time. That's my buddy Brian up in Northern California. The array that you see pictured there is still operating today at over 80% of its original capability after 30, oh, gee whiz, this would be 81, so now 37 years that these modules have been in use and exposed to the elements. Several, several have browned like you see there. It's interesting that they didn't all brown equally, but that was a function of the variations in materials used back in that time. But the fact is that these modules can last a long time, but the will the flash roof mounts and roof last this long? And most people are surprised to find out merely to have to remove and reinstall a PV array, five kilowatt array, will cost somewhere between $2,500 and $7,500, whereas when you buy the quality flash mount, the cost pales in comparison, a small fraction, $250 to maximum for some of the more sophisticated, difficult to install mounts, $750 to buy the mount, certainly have the labor to install it, but the, the cost differential is, is insignificant when you look at the cost to remove and reinstall. So we feel that in the long run, quality flash mounts installed properly are cheap insurance. They eliminate the potential or greatly minimize the potential for having to remove the array to fix a roof leak underneath the array. Long-term waterproofing is challenging because uh, after 10 years, you, you struggle with things like thermal expansion contraction of a metal rack system that's more often than not, bolted to a wooden roof structure. So your relative expansion distances and contraction distances vary between the 
the racking system and the roof, which will flex your mounts every day. Wind obviously contributes to that flex. And when you consider the dozens of holes that one drills into a roof to mount a solar system, it's appreci you can appreciate that even a small problem with leaks could relate in a big cost issue because you don't need all 50 of those penetrations to leak to have a leak. You need only one out of 50. And if you do it right 99 times out of 100, that still means that there's there's a, a pretty substantial percentage of, of mounts that could leak over time. So be sensitive to the statistical issues. This is such an important issue that in the inaugural issue of the industry's top technical trade publication, Solar Pro, they, ad they address this issue with, an, with a statistic that is really quite concerning, 80% of lawsuits in the construction industry are a function of leaks so you must take this issue seriously quick mount pv certainly does and we were born in the trades as we like to say we're now the leading manufacturer of residential flash roof mounts for rooftop solar installations with over 25 years experience in metal fabrication construction and solar installation dedicated to quality code compliant waterproof solar installations and the future of the solar power and sustainability concepts. I, I, I feel really privileged to work for a company that's dedicated to the highest ideals of installing quality products for the best long-term cost performance and uh, ensuring the long-term success of renewable energy. So with that said, we now are going to jump into the details and I will again encourage anybody that has any questions to uh, post them to the question box. Um, we'll start with uh, uh, the fact that the roof types we're discussing here, we used to refer to them as specialty roofs, and I never really probably thought that was the greatest term to use. The fact is that shake, slate, and metal shingle roofs represent a very small percentage overall of the U.S. residential or pitched roof market, to be specific. I dislike, I guess, referring to a roof as a commercial or a residential roof. There are relevant reasons for doing that at times but typically speaking uh, products like you see here shake slate and metal shingle roofs are installed on what's known as a steep slope roof where it's pitched up from the horizon at a decent angle to facilitate water shedding of things like shake slate or metal shingle but when you again look at the overall roof market in the, in the u.s these three roof types represent certainly less than five percent of all the pitched roofs used uh, metal shingles have been growing though in in the past several years so it's feasible to think that we're seeing as much now as five percent of the roofs in the US that might be using metal shingles uh, they're they're actually one of my of these three roof types they're my favorite for a variety of reasons that I'll point out but uh, but you know the other two certainly have their place and they're trickier and that's the reason we make this training available to give folks a uh, a better appreciation for how you tackle these more complex, less common roof types. We'll start with a quick summary, cedar shake. Now these are beautiful roofs that can interestingly, surprisingly have an ex a, a significant lifespan. Up to 60 years of life is certainly possible with a quality treated shake wood shake that is a roof that's maintained and that's the important thing to realize it's not as if you install the shake roof walk away for 60 years come back and everything's still fine no one thing about shake even though it is a very attractive roof is it does require more diligent service over time than would be required in other roof types uh, you can get shake today that have a 30-year warranty and the cost is typically addressed in the roofing realm by referring to a square, which is a 10 foot by 10 foot section of roofing. So 100 square feet in essence. And cedar shake is not inexpensive. It's in comparison to asphalt shingles, it's two to three times the price. Uh, cedar shake uh, um, is typically used for aesthetic reasons more than anything else. But there is also a benefit that it is a natural building material it's by its nature inherently renewable and um, again when properly maintained over time can reduce uh, dependence on 
uh, foreign substances. Asphalt shingles obviously are made with with oil and uh, cedar shake is made with wood. So that's one of the benefits. Slate also is a natural material. It's a piece of rock that's that's uh, uh, quarried out of slate quarries, most of them being in the northeastern part of the country, which is where you tend to find most slate roofs. And in fact, it's a wonderful roofing material because it is a rock. It repels water extraordinarily good. It's got it's got uh, overall long-term durability, over a hundred year life. Now in fairness, again, slate is the type of roof material where there is occasional service necessary and you would require an experienced slate roofer to do it. And they are by far the most expensive roof types, a thousand to two thousand dollars a square. Um, so just extraordinarily expensive, but really neat looking, excellent roof material once you've put it up there. And uh, oftentimes would be used in historic preservation districts in the northeastern part of the country where slate was a common roofing material in nicer structures of the time. Finally, metal shingle, my favorite, probably because it offers the best combination of price and long-term performance. In fact, you can get up to 75 years of life with a metal shingle. So that's darned impressive. 50-year warranty available on some metal shingles, and they're reasonably priced as a premium roof product goes, $250 to $450 per square. One of the other things I really like about metal shingle is it can be used effectively in high wind zone areas. It's a very lightweight roofing material if you look at it, and uh, when you get the better metal shingles that are, have those granulated surfaces that really retard most of the UV degradation and... Uh, also assist in, you know, in uh, keeping that metal roof panel in good condition over time. Uh, this is just a really uh, fantastic combination of, uh, of, of how shall we say, um, uh, uh, performance considerations. So metal shingles are a really growing segment. In fact, compared to shake and slate, uh, shake has been declining primarily because of uh, fire considerations in California. Uh, slate is just prohibitively expensive for all but those uh, er areas that are, I guess, historically relevant to shake roof. Metal shingles have been growing because they offer a, a great combination of attractiveness and long-term performance. They are perfect matches for solar because, as we've just seen from life expectancies, they can easily last the life of a solar array. They're long lifespan roofs. They're also high quality roofs. And to afford these more expensive roofs, the typical homeowner that would have this roof type would uh, have greater financial resources, as logic would dictate. The challenge, though, is that they are complex. The degree of difficulty installing on all three of these roofs is certainly more than an asphalt shingle roof or even a tile roof. And many installers, because they fear damaging these roofs and expensive liability, tend to avoid them. That's re going to minimize the number of competitors chasing after these projects. A typical solar project now has oftentimes several contractors bidding and, and the perspective system owner has dozens, if not hundreds of companies to choose from. Uh, in the case of these three roof types, most typical solar installers will just not even tackle a slate, shake, or metal shingle roof for the complexities that come in. So in the end, higher skills necessary to tackle these roofs will be rewarded with higher margins, profitability, less competition. So we'll then now jump into shake, which I will admit, uh, shake roofs are beautiful. There's no two ways about it. It is one of the earliest roofing materials that was ever employed. Uh, it, when done well, uh, can provide incredible performance over the long term. Now I say when done well only because we are dealing with a natural building material. The dilemma with wood that's cut thin as cedar shake is that sometimes it'll cup and curl and split and that's where maintenance would be required. Keeping in mind that when you look at a typical shake roof, you'll see as that image in the lower right depicts that the shake are very long and the 
all the seams that could lead to the underlayment are covered by the shake just uphill far enough. But if it cracks or curls, then that shake must be replaced. So this is one of the considerations with a, a roof-like shake and something that you need to be sensitive to as you're installing solar and walking around on it, that uh, you can, if the shake is older, more brittle, dried out, cupped, you can crack them easily and that could introduce a prospective leak problem. So that said, uh, uh, there are also varying configurations of shake roofs such as uh, shake that are applied over the top of a solid wood sheathing deck or sometimes you still have those old skip sheathing decks that exist out there where there is no solid wood deck so if you're standing in the attic you can literally see gaps between the the skip sheathing where you see the shake itself or you might see the underlayment. The Cedar Shake and Shingle Bureau website is an excellent resource as it provides the new roof construction manual, which in essence is the official installation instructions for installing shake on roofs. You can download this manual for free at the web link that's shown there. And there is an installation video that I took a screenshot in the lower right there that shows the shake roof as it's being constructed in the conventional manner where you have interspersed layers of uh, underlayment and shake, underlayment and shake, forming that water shedding design that, uh, that is typical for a shake roof. We do have a cool purpose-built mount for shake called the Classic Shake Roof Mount pictured on screen here. It looks very similar to our E-mount or a Classic Comp Mount other than it's bigger. It's 18 inches by 18 inches. Each uh, box is going to have 12 of the mounts and it would have all of the required hardware to be able to mount your L-foot to the mount when all is said and done. So it does use our standard elevated water seal with the Q block that's elevated 1.25 inches off the roof surface, off the flashing surface, and the hanger bolt design with the double seal. So this is a product that we've had for many years and very long uh, performing uh, well-tested product over the years. We also have an alternative product option which is called our Cubase Shake and Slate Mount which uses a conventional standoff post that's bolted to the rafter usually with two two lag screws that go right, right into the wood rafter and then it includes a uh, flashing that goes over the top of it with a rubber seal and that fit up between the flashing and the post is quite tight. Generally put a bit of sealant there with that rubber seal as an additional measure of protection. So there are pros and cons to both the integrated classic shake roof mount and the Cubase shake and slate mount. I tend to be a proponent for shake roof using the classic shake roof mount. It's my preferred product because the installation is easy and uh, it, it really works well. Although there is some more versatility that could come from a standoff design, particularly if it's a new shake roof or a re-roof that has shake going in where the roofer would install the flashings and the solar installer could install the, the, the base and post right down to the wood deck. So that's one of the benefits of using a design like the Cubase shake and slate mount. The other benefit is if you're in the Northeast where you have a mixture of shake and slate roofs, this product works with both types. So that's another benefit. So the classic shake roof mount, which I mentioned is my preferred product where it can be used, is, is my preferred product because it's easy to install. It's specifically designed for shake roofs. It does have an 18 inch wide by tall, 18 inch tall flashing so that it can get far enough uphill so that the upper edge of that flashing gets up into the third course of the shake. It works with the natural waterproofing of the roof. It has all the same benefits of the elevated water seal on our classic comp mount. And again, it does work it with that natural water shedding uh, construction approach of a shake roof. Now, this image here does a little better job of showing before the shake get installed how the upper edge of the classic shake mount in, gets tucked right uphill into under the course of felt paper that would be uphill of where the mount would go. Notice that when this is installed, the rectangular block is positioned just about half inch, three quarter inch below the butt edge of the shake that sits directly on top of it. So that is the prototypical installation configuration and it was sized in such a way so that that upper edge with the 18 inch 
tall flashing can slide up to get up under that uh, felt paper. Generally speaking, you want to get an inch, maybe a little bit more than an inch uh, up under that felt paper. Now, one thing I will caution is when you are sliding that flashing up into place on an existing shake roof, be very careful to make certain that that upper edge of that flashing gets up under that black piece of felt underlayment. You don't want to tear that. That would be a problem. So you've got to be very careful as you're feeding it. Obviously, you kind of angle it down in so it's going to slide under that felt paper and not catch the edge and tear it. This is uh, some diagrams that are out of the uh, the Cedar Shake and Shingle Bureau's installation instructions showing the two kinds of sheathing that you're likely to encounter. The upper configuration is what we refer to as either skip or spaced sheathing. It's usually one by six boards that have a few inches in between them, and the shake then would be nailed to those boards. Now, the whole logic of having spaced sheathing is to allow the roof structure to dry out more quickly after a rain event. So if you're in a really wet area, like the Pacific Northwest, where shake isn't as common, they do have them. Uh, the problem is that the roofs there, of course, uh, stay wet for so long that biological growth is much more feasible. So you could find in a wetter climate that you might have roofs were constructed with the spaced sheathing. Although the building codes changed back in the, I believe it was the 80s when that changed, to mandate new roofs would have solid sheathing like is shown in the lower configuration. In essence, one would argue that the solid sheathing, uh, while it may not uh, have the benefit of having air circulating on the backside of the underlayment like you see on the space sheathing, still when done properly can uh, drain water efficiently and, and remain watertight. That said, there is the potential if you were to uh, run into a shake roof as an installer that you might have space sheathing. That shouldn't complicate matters tremendously, but just be sensitive to the fact that uh, that you do have those gaps at those intervals. And um, you want to make certain that your mount is, all, whenever possible, positioned directly over the top of one of the pieces of space sheathing rather than in those spaces between the spaced sheathing. So... Uh, solid sheathing is just easier to install over because you don't have those gaps to worry about. But generally speaking, when you position your roof attachment in the prototypical position, that rectangular block or the or the uh, the base should be positioned right over a piece of solid uh, or of, of spaced sheathing. All right, so that is shake, and now we'll transition to the most expensive and difficult roof type. Uh, but before we do that, uh, Josh says, how would this product work with cedar breather that can't be compressed? I'm not sure if I'm familiar with cedar breather, Josh. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to look at that after the webinar to see if I can answer your question more effectively. But when you say, uh, you know, Anything that can't be compressed, certainly our products will bolt from the outside through the sheathing down to whatever's below, and we want to make certain that that uh, you know that, that whatever we're bolting through can have the capacity of a lag screw be inserted through it, tightening down a mount that's going to be able to withstand wind uplift and all that fun stuff. Now, slate is the most expensive, as already mentioned, common in historic areas, which can complicate matters because for those of you that have ever done work in a historic preservation district, you'll find that the local jurisdictional rules are, are subservient, if you will, to the historical preservation district's rules and regulations. So installing solar on a slate home, slate roof home, can be complex if for no other reason that a historic preservation district may or may not allow that to happen. If they do allow it to happen, they likely have more stringent guidelines as to what would be permissible from an aesthetic perspective. Also, sadly, while slate is an awesome roofing material, being a rock and being incredibly good at shedding water, it's the type of rock that can break easily. For those of you that ever dealt with rocks that are like slate, you know that they can crack pretty easily when you put pressure on them from above. And sadly, slate roofs don't take to somebody walking across them very well because the slate often cracks and breaks off. So what 
we strongly recommend is that you partner with experienced slate roofers to install these mounts, the racking, and the modules. That's the best practice. You could get to the point where you have that capability within your own organization. If you're based, for example, in Vermont, there's a lot of slate roofs in that part of the world, and uh, although not a lot of people, <laughs> Uh, so saying a lot is kind of a relative term. It's a sparsely populated state. That said, throughout parts of the Northeast where you do have slate roofs, uh, it would likely be beneficial to bring somebody in-house that has that slate roofing expertise to be part of your normal crew. Now, the product we're going to show the installation with is that same Cubase shake and slate mount. As mentioned, it works not just on on uh, 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 shake, uh, shake roofs, but it does work on slate roofs. So the procedure that we outline here is we're going to find the rafter. Now I'm going to tell you right now that finding the rafter through the top of the roof on slate is not feasible. This is the domain of what we refer to as attic rafter mapping, where you're going to go into the attic, you're going to measure the distance from one rafter to the next, usually uh, f try to, you know, you could either drill a hole from the inside out, which certainly is desirable, uh, or figure out some way to find that first rafter. Once you've got the first la rafter location, you can find all the others because you've measured the dimensions on the inside of the roof. And fortunately, a typical slate roof is a relatively steep pitch roof, meaning you have decent attic access. So, uh, attic rafter mapping, which is one of the seven te techniques we outline in our rafter finding video on our website, is the most practical option because finding the rafter from the top of the roof on slate is impractical. So in this case, we'll find our rafter locations, mark them, position our flashing so that the bottom edge of the flashing is just a bit uphill from the butt edge of the of the slate that it'll be sitting directly on top of. We're going to mark where that base position would be. As you can see in the center image, drill holes through the slate uh, with a masonry bit. Then we're going to, it's kind of like cutting glass. We're going to do use a, a diamond blade on a grinder to score the slate just enough so that we can slide a flat bar, roofing bar up in there and tap on that score line with a hammer to cleanly break that slate in a straight line. This now creates this little pocket area you see in the right-hand image, and we can then locate uh, the center hole that we that we uh, drew earlier in that slide, previous slide, and we're going to use a four-inch diameter diamond hole saw to cut through the slate so we now are right at the wood deck. So here you can see in the left-hand image we now are all the way down to the deck. Obviously, we're going to have to drill our holes through the wood deck into the rafter to secure our base to the rafter. As always, fill those holes with the appropriate sealant. And then in the right-hand image, we're showing an impact driver being used to tighten down the lag screws that are going through the wood deck into the rafter to secure the base to the rafter. Now comes a slightly delicate operation where you're going to take the malleable aluminum flashing that goes over the post and you're going to slide it uphill. Now here's the trick. The, each and every slate is held into the roof by usually by copper nails. The problem is that those copper nail heads might be sticking up a bit above the slate that they're holding in place. And what might happen is you're sliding that flashing up into place. You can catch the head of that copper nail preventing you from being able to slide it up into place. So a little trick to help you get around that is you take a thin piece of, of just galvanized sheet steel that you see in the center image that has very poor quality, my apologies. You slide it uphill. You get between where those nails are, slide it further uphill, and then move it over to the right or to the left to get over the top of the nail head, and then slide the flashing in over the top of that. So you can, that little, you know, nine inch wide piece of sheet steel can help you just be a, a feeding guide, so to speak, to get that flashing positioned up into place. And then, of course, you'll position the cone of the flashing over the, the uh, buttressed cue base itself. And then you'll screw the post into place, put some sealant around where the flashing cone meets the post, and put on the EPDM rubber seal. So that's the installation procedure for slate. A few more things I want to say about slate before I answer a couple questions and then we get into metal shingles. 
my favorite of the three roof types. Um, first and foremost, slate is easily broken, and you can see a couple strat or a couple strategies over the next couple slides to deal with that. You can certainly use a ladder laid across the roof to distribute your load. And here, you know, that, that certainly can work. It might be a little bit better to put something like a carpet remnant, as you see on the ladder positioned on the right image here. But I will point out in these images, look at the broken slate. You see, in fact, on that right-hand image, right on the rake of the roof, right at the edge, on right about middle of the photo toward the right side, you see those couple broken slate. Well, that's getting to the point where if you don't fix those slate, the water can leak down to the roof deck because they're broken so high up, they may not be covering anymore the headlap of the slate that's two, two layers down. That's the problem. So any broken slate, like you see here, particularly the ones where they're broken at about the halfway point, absolutely must be repaired. And that requires an experienced slate roofer. Replacing slate's a little tricky. Unfortunately, you can't just replace, replace a piece of slate and nail it back into place because the nails are hidden by the slate that's on top of it. Unless you want to strip all the slate off the roof, all the way up to the ridge, you now have to use what's called slate clips. They're special clips made by Loctite, or, oh goodness, uh, Storm Lock Fastener used to be Newport Fastener. So Stormlock Fastener makes these neat clips that can allow you to secure slate back into, you know, as a repair into the existing roof. There are other slate clips that you can see out there. But it, again, this is best left to an experienced slate roofer because these they're, they're expensive roofs to have to repair. Trying to find a matching slate that would be the uh, color is going to be, you know, another cost consideration. So be uh, cognizant of the fact that damage is expensive and you need to have a contingency plan for repairs after the PV installation is complete. Here we've got a, the probably the more elegant solution is using some kind of man lift or cherry picker to hover above the roof surface to install the roof attachments, the rails, and the modules. So this is certainly the luxurious way of installing. I've never had the benefit of being able to install on a man lift, but uh, certainly there are limitations to being able to do this. The biggest one is access to the roof from the ground to position a man lift effectively for installation. This particular home had sufficient access. Uh, I would argue that that's not the norm per se, but wherever it might be possible, it can be the lowest cost way of installing on slate because the likelihood of breaking it is less and then you're not spending thousands of dollars in slate repairs afterward. All right, there's a couple questions I'll take, and then we'll address metal shingles. The first comes from Andrew that says, uh, we ran into cedar shingles with shorter and smaller pieces of cedar than shake. Yeah, that is, that's a little trickier, Andrew, and you can indeed use our standard uh, asphalt shingle flashings for that, so that might be the solution. He says, how do you get around pulling so many shingles up, and how do you reach them after installing the flashing? Well, the... Uh, there really is no need per se to pull a cedar shingle out to install on it. You can use, again, something like our E-mount should be sufficient depending on the dimensions of the cedar shingle. I would recommend uh, for roofs like that, talk with our tech support department uh, before you tackle that. Just be sensitive that cedar shingles being thinner pieces of wood than a cedar shake uh, may be a little bit more sensitive to work on. So that could be a consideration that makes you question how you approach it. But there's not as many cedar shingle roofs as shake for the reason I just mentioned. Uh, Josh has posted a link that says, uh, do you see a reaction between the copper nails and the flashing? Uh, no, Josh, we haven't seen any problem. You don't want those to be in direct contact. So if you do have a copper nail, that's a valid point that one would... Uh, recommend putting a barrier material. You'll see that here in the coming slides to prevent the copper from making direct contact with the aluminum. But the good thing is that since that is positioned uphill of where the water would be, 
there's no, there shouldn't be much in the way of moisture to facilitate any galvanic corrosion occurring. But in fairness, it is desirable to have barrier materials wherever you have dissimilar metals like copper and aluminum in direct contact with one another. But I, I do have a really neat photo to show here in just a minute that will show you a great strategy to getting around that. And uh, Josh goes on to ask, does this product work with irregular slate or different geometric shapes? Uh, the answer is likely yes, Josh, but there are some unusual shapes of shingles sometimes that would, might require a little bit more creative approach. Generally, the answer would be yes. Our flash mounts can work with the broad range of shingles or shake or slate, but there are times where you might need to cut, just like we showed on the slate roof. You're cutting up into the slate with that, with that diamond grind, blade grinder uh, to score it and break it off clean. So continuing on now with metal shingle roofs and stay tuned, Josh, for a little bit more on how you create a barrier between aluminum and other metals to prevent any kind of unnecessary corrosion. But the beauty of metal shingles, in addition to being lightweight and relatively cost effective for a premium roof type, is there's such a diversity of products. You have those that uh, install sometimes on battens, which I prefer to, to facilitate more efficient water drainage for anything that could potentially leak past or wind-driven rain that can blow past the metal shingles. You've got uh, interlocking deck-mounted uh, shingles, which uh, oftentimes look like wood shingle or asphalt shingles. Uh, that You can also have metal shingles that look like slate or wood shake or tile. Actually, it's interesting because when you see that interlocking slate in the lower right and you compare it to natural slate, the cost is like probably one quarter to use an interlocking slate roof. Um, but it looks a little more uniform than traditional slate. So uh, if it's a two-story roof, the likelihood is you won't be able to, uh, the average civilian wouldn't know any different. Uh, if it's a single story roof, it might look a little more uniform than slate looks, but I would uh, be hard pressed to justify the added cost of slate. I'd probably go with the interlocking metal shingle slate that mounts directly to the deck usually. And then again, you have the wood shake appearing metal shingles, which would be in the long run much more cost effective than a wood shake roof, given the fact that the maintenance requirements on these roofs are negligible. That's the beauty of it. Installed properly, quality underlayment, quality installation practices, these roofs are super low maintenance over time. The major manufacturers include Decra, Girard, Metro, Tamco, but there's literally dozens of metal shingle manufacturers out there. Now be aware, it's entirely feasible you have an old asphalt shingle roof under a metal shingle. It probably isn't going to cause you too much problems in some cases, but some when when uh, installers, solar installers encounter this, oftentimes they figure, well, let's remove the metal shingles. We'll put new asphalt shingles down, put asphalt shingle mounts in, install the PV array, and just install metal shingles around the perimeter and that transition zone to make it blend in. So that's a, a technique we refer to as picture framing. If you check out our tile webinar, we've got some nice photos of picture framing or insetting like that, but it can be used there. Walking on metal shingles can be a precarious proposition because you can bend them. Now, the typical walking pattern for many metal, sh metal shingles is very similar to tile where you can walk in many, not all, metal shingles in that downhill lap section. So the butt edge, uh, the bottom edge of each metal shingle where it sits on top of the metal shingle just below it tends to be the strongest area for most but not all metal shingles. And it would be the safe place to walk. If you step further uphill like you see in the lower image, well, you're risking the potential of denting metal shingles. And unfortunately, like denting your car, undenting it ain't easy. <laughs> Typically, the strategy is to replace the entire metal panel. So that's something you want to avoid if you can if you can possibly do so is denting these darn things. It's kind of the equivalent of breaking a tile by stepping on it in the wrong place. It's not a cheap repair. It's not, you know, break a broken tile ain't is not terribly complex to fix. Dented metal shingles can be much more complex to fix and much more expensive. So be appreciative of the place where you can walk and not walk. Now, I'm going to show you six different types of metal shingles that 
Decra makes, the largest manufacturer. And you'll see that for their Decra tile product, their Villa tile, or their Shake product, they all have the same walk pattern where you can step in the lower portion of the metal shingle and they do not want you to step in the higher or the uphill portion of the of the metal shingle. You'll notice that uh, they call that the no stepping zone. However, if you now look at this Decra shingle product, the product that looks like slate, slate or shingles, notice that it's not a function of uphill or downhill. It's a function of side laps. Where you have two sections of metal shingles that come together, they do not want you stepping on those side laps because there's no support. You can bend them down. So that is indeed the uh, difference in a Decra shingle product is that the permissible step zone has nothing to do with uphill, downhill. It has to do with the side laps. So be appreciative of the variations that exist in these metal shingles so that you can uh, uh, tackle them in the correct manner. So the picture on screen we have here is a batten style metal shingle. In fact, this is a counter batten where we have first a series of wood battens that are uh, installed uh, running uphill and downhill on the roof. And then across wise horizontally oriented batten structure that the metal shingles will screw into. This is my, I would say, kind of preferred approach, particularly for wet climates, because it will facilitate extraordinarily rapid drying out at the underlayment level after a rain event. So the longevity of a roof like you see pictured will be better than metal shingles that are uh, screwed to standard horizontal wood battens that are screwed to the roof because then those each bat horizontal batten represents a water dam. That's the norm on tile roofs too is that on my roof uh, when I had the home built 20 years ago we had standard horizontal battens that were uh, bolted right down to nailed right down to the uh, the felt paper and there's a couple inch gap between each wood batten uh, that allowed water to drain through it but it just doesn't dry out as quickly and, and doesn't last as long. The nice feature of any batten style metal shingle installation is they're really easy to remove a single metal shingle. I'll show you some photos. Now the interlocking metal shingles tend to be direct deck mounted and as a result, they can be a little bit more complex to work on because sometimes you have to remove all of them going uphill, but there are ways you can get around that with some newer techniques. That said, the downside to an interlocking metal shingle right on the roof is, again, you got to be careful of not walking on those side laps, and they don't offer quite the thermal barrier that mounting to a batten does. When you space that metal shingle up off the roof deck, you get less heat absorbed into the attic space, so batten mounts have added advantage of lowering the heat gain of an attic, which is really important in a warmer climate. So, uh, but that said, if you're in a cooler climate, mounting these metal shingles directly to a wood deck may be perfectly permissible uh, as the heat gain in the summer is less of a consideration. And a lot of times those roofs are, or the attic spaces are quite well insulated in a colder climate area. We do have on our website a helpful guide that will give you some guidance as to which product might be su best suited to your particular shingle type. If you have an interlocking or a non-interlocking metal shingle, whether it's made by Decker or or, or Gerard uh, or any other company. We have several, or we have two different flashing methods, a sandwich flashing and an underpan flashing method. And uh, then we have some hybrid approaches. And all, so all this is explained at our website. First thing I'd recommend is check out our quick mount PV steel shingle mount calculator. That should be metal shingle, but either way, uh, check it out because that'll that'll help you determine things like the appropriate post height that would be required for the specific metal shingle, depending if it's mounted on a batten or a counter batten or direct to the deck. And then again, we show the different flashing methods for the different shingle types that you likely would encounter. The link to access the spreadsheet calculator is shown on screen. You can always download this presentation by navigating to our website and that'll get you right into that link. And it will select the post length that would be best suited to the specific metal shingles that you'd be working on. 
There are two different products that we use in metal shingles. The Cubase Shake and Slate mount that we already looked at before, the one that has the 18 inch tall by 18 inch wide flashing, that also works on metal shingles. You'll have to trim it down in most cases a bit, but it works perfectly well. You have the standard standoff and post and base with all the hardware. And again, it's 18 inches by 18 inches. And we also, for certain configurations, can use our Cubase comp mount which has a 12 inch by 12 inch flashing and would typically be used on asphalt shingle roofs, but it works well with, with usually direct attached metal shingles that look like an asphalt shingle or a wood shingle. This product would work well. Incidentally, for the question that came up on the wood shingle products, again, this product that you see here would be a suitable product on wood shingles. Again, the flashing is 12 inches by 12 inches, so it's a smaller flashing, so it would be used on any metal shingles that have a a, a, a reveal that's less than six inches. Uh, we'll talk now about the different approaches for retrofit. Usually the sandwich flashing or flashing sandwich is the best approach. And if you have a new roof, using an underpan method would be the best approach. We show the various diagrams in our installation instructions here. We're showing the interlocking flashing sandwich that has a shingle over the top of our flashing, which is over the top of uh, uh, another existing metal shingle. Uh, we also show the non-interlocking flashing sandwich, the underpan method, and the interlocking underpan. The underpan is very, very much like a metal shingle. It, it looks like it. It just usually doesn't have granulated surface on it. Uh, but there are various d designs and underpans depending on the specific metal shingle that you're working on. Our installation instructions that you see here, you know, many of the steps are fairly straightforward. Uh, obviously, finding your rafter, again, would be best done, if possible, through attic rafter mapping, because you ain't going to be tapping with a hammer on a metal shingle to find a rafter underneath it. That's just not possible. You could remove the metal shingle and do that. But uh, in this case, what we're, we're assuming is that your rafters have been mapped. You mark your rafter location. You, you, you uh, cut a hole through the metal shingle, generally using some kind of tin snips. And uh, we do show a procedure for getting started here in a, in a moment on how to get that hole started. Drill through the rafters, put your sealant in, install the base down to the rafter, put the post in place. Now you're going to lay the 18 inch by 18 inch flashing on the metal shingles and cut off the excess material that goes too far uphill in step number nine in the upper right image there. And you'll see in step 10 now, we've got that flashing that's been cut to size and we're going to mold it because it's a malleable aluminum material to the contours of this curved tile looking metal shingle. Uh, the next thing we need to do is to mark positions on our replacement metal shingle that we're going to put over the top of this flashing to create the sandwich. And then we cut this uh, U-shaped cutout into the metal shingle that's going to go over the top of the flashing. And in step number 14, what we're showing is if you have the interlocking shingles that don't just bolt, unbolt like you see in step 13, we've taken the screws out of the shingle at the top of the image in step 13. Uh, well, if you have interlocking, you can't unbolt those shingles and just remove them as you wish. You then would just trim the upper edge and slide it into that lap area that you see in step number 14. And then in step 15, we're securing the bottom edge of the metal shingle to the batten or directly to the deck and uh, sealing around the post with the rubber seal. So this is the typical sandwich method of flashing where the flashing is now sandwiched between the existing metal shingle and a replacement metal shingle that matches the color and the style of the existing metal shingles used on that roof. That's one of the important criteria on metal shingle roofs is you must find out who the manufacturer is, what color the shingle is, and what style it is. The good news is if you remove a single metal shingle on the back of these metal shingles, they have a code that provides you all of that information. Now there's an underpan method that would typically be used on new roofs where you would install a uh, metal underpan. That's this uh, material here that has no granulated stones on it. And in this case, 
We have batten mounted installations. I won't go through all the detailed steps. You can read the installation instructions easily downloaded at our website. But you're going to cut your hole. You're going to put the underpan down. Then the flashing would go over the top of that. And then you would install another replacement metal panel over the top of that whole assembly to where when you're finished, you have a really matching system. I've got a better image here. This is a tri typical standard batten system where you've got a wood batten mounted directly to the underlayment on the deck. Uh, the Each and every metal roof shingle is screwed into the batten by nature of those bright white pinpoints that you see in the left-hand image. Those are the screw heads. So we remove those screws, remove the metal panel. We then find our rafter, which is easy when you got the underlayment exposed like you see here. You can use a uh, hammer tapping method or even exploratory drilling because you'll be flashing this. You put down your base. You then install the underpan over the top of it by cutting out the hole to clear that base. And now you see the underpan now in the left hand image installed over the base. We then cut our flashing to fit into the appropriate location. The flashing is then molded to the underpan and then we cut the roof panel a hole through the roof panel to clear the cone of the flashing and when you're done you've got that black anodized aluminum flashing pictured here sandwiched between the orange roof panel and that bronze colored underpan now any water that might go through where that sealant's being applied that sealant is there decoratively it's not really serving a water proofing function but any any water that might leak down there in that interface will harmlessly drip down the cone of the flashing down the top of the flashing and exit right where you see that bronze colored underpan peeking out from underneath that metal roof shingle so that's the basic premise of flashing with this and those color grip matching granules oops put on really just help it blend in when all is said and done so it just looks nice when you finish up the installation and uh, these color matching granules didn't match quite as clear. Most of them are identical match to the original roofing material. And you can get those color matching granule kits from Decra or Gerard or the companies that make this or from your local roofing supply house that would have stock for metal shingles. Now we show this underpan method here in our installation instructions. This is for incidentally a direct attached metal shingle. The underpan is a much simpler affair, a flat piece of metal with upturned edges. And we do show the barrier material, in this case a standard piece of felt underlayment that's being used to separate the bottom of the aluminum base with the top of the uh, galvanized steel underpan so you do want that barrier material so just a simple piece of underlayment you can use self-adhering underlayment which is even better uh, and i'll show you in a, in a moment and then you need to cut out notches in these interlocking steel shingles at the bottom edge so that in image 13 any moisture that enters at the flashing cone will harmlessly drip downhill two notches cut like you see in image 13 is preferable to facilitate water draining efficiently and drying out now you're going to fill in that gap of course with sealant and the color matching granules but realize that it's not presumed that that sealant is waterproof that's there strictly for aesthetic purposes and if water drips down there it's working with the natural water drainage system of this arrangement now we do. Um, uh, we did an installation on uh, uh, Ty Pennington's home. He's the host of uh, the TV show Extreme Home Makeovers. Uh, tall fella who's uh, got a, a bit of a wacky sense of humor. But he had a Decra Shingle XD installed on his home in Florida. And uh, just to show you a few of the images. Oops. This is sorry. This is the roof before any of the metal shingles were installed. You can see all the valley metal has been installed. They've got the five rib valley metal and uh, uh, what appears to be a fully adhered underlayment, which is in Florida. Makes sense because, you know, you're, you're always going to assume there's going to be sufficient wind driven rain that it will get up onto your underlayment. And having a fully adhered underlayment gives you longer term waterproofing protection. Here's some shingles that are going onto a section of roof that did not get a PV system. And you can just kind of see those direct attached metal shingles being installed right down over the top of that synthetic fully adhered underlayment. Uh, these are the underpans that were used on this new metal shingle roof. As you can see, it's just a flat piece of metal with upturned edges on the side. They nail down the uphill edge, 
find the rafter and drill the holes for the base. And then the barrier material that we use here to separate the aluminum base from the galvanized steel is a, um, a self-adhering underlayment that uh, makes it really easy because you just cut it to fit around the base and then you've got a nice barrier material that gets screwed down to the um, to the um, uh, to the uh, into the rafter my apologies and then uh, the, the the roofer on this job was very conservative he installed the 12 inch by 12 inch flashing with the requisite upside down u-shaped bead of sealant and then he put another bead on the outer edges screwed those two flashings together to form a really robust long-term seal and then uh, of course did the preparation to put the metal panel over the top of the mount the way that you start your hole to cut it out with tin snips is to take usually a big nail drive it through the center whack it to the side with your hammer to create that gash that you can feed your tin snip uh, the points your tin snip down into, and then you cut that uh, spiral out to get your circle. And then, and then uh, we cut those drain hole notches right downhill from where the mount will be. And here's an example of one of those drainage slots that's just downhill of this metal shingle flashing pictured here. Uh, and then we're finishing up this job on Ty Pennington's house, put the sealant in, uh, apply the color matching granules, which you can see here match really close, put sealant around the base and post and the flashing, and then we finish off with the rubber seal. Uh, and here's just a nicer picture of the full finished assembly of the mount installed. And uh, of course, they just finished the rest of the roof. And that was it. So we are done, folks. I really appreciate everybody's participation. I'll take any remaining questions. And I uh, do just want to remind people that uh, we do have a full range of products for just about every roof type, from shingles to tile to shake slate, metal shingle, low slope roofs. Our new L-mount for asphalt shingle roofs is available at distributors around the country. It offers a very economical way to get the quality of quick mount PV with the elevated water seal. We also have added the rounded corner flashing to our conduit mount and to our E-mount. So that's a nice upgrade with those alignment guide notches that make positioning it much faster and easier. Our universal accessory frame bracket is the easy way to attach a microinverter or maximizer to a PV module frame, particularly if you don't have a rail available in a rail-free system, but it's another way to speed up the installation by mounting all of the microinverters down on the ground on your modules so that when you transport the module up to the roof, all the wire management is done. You just have to clip your modules into place. We also have our Q box, which allows you to transition your PV cables and ground wires into the attic with an elevated water seal. Our tile replacement mount is available where you replace the existing concrete tile with metal form fitting flashing to yield an unbroken hopefully, tile that can be used to service other broken tile on the roof that matches. We do have that concept available also for our quick hook and uh, conduit penetration flashings and conduit mounts for tile. Our quick rack rail free system for asphalt shingle roof has been available for a few years. Check our website for more information. While there, you can request any of these products by clicking that green free sample button. Don't forget our podcast series, which can be found very easily by Googling the search term Solar Roof Talk and uh, listen to the latest episode addressing the relaxed setbacks and pathways and cutting vent pipes down under arrays. That's a new code re uh, development for the building residential and plumbing codes that recognize officially now cutting off vent pipes. We talk about that in our latest podcast. Our mobile training center can come to your place of business. Call our sales department to talk about scheduling for that. If you want to email me, my email address is shown on screen, jeff.spees at quickmountpv. Uh, you can also contact our tech support by just emailing tech at quickmountpv. And check our website for frequently asked questions as well as product information, engineering documentation, training downloads, a list of trade show and events, and distributors. Don't forget, while you're there, get a free sample of whatever product interests you. And here's a list of all the events we're attending this year. Coming up very soon in March, COSIA. We will be at uh, the COSIA conference, at the NABCEP conference. That's my favorite of the year where I'll be moderating a couple 
technical uh, training sessions, panel discussions. The Oregon Solar Expo, the Midwest Renewable Energy Fair, Inner Solar, and Solar Power International. My favorite event of the year next to the NABSEP conference is the Midwest Renewable Energy Fair, which is an outdoor energy fair, really a fun event. And uh, our website has a tremendous volume of educational resources. You can check out our webinars like the one you're involved in right now, but also we've got video tutorials like Finding Rafters. Uh, so check that out and uh, then you can also look at our training calendar for the hands-on training events. We will be conducting a big training event. I won't go into details now on March 1st at our corporate headquarters in Walnut Creek, uh, where afterward we will be having those screenings of the documentary film that tells the story about how the PV industry started. You will get one credit for NAPSEP for participating in today's webinar emailed in one to two weeks, including links to download today's presentation, check your spam filter as always, and please provide us with any helpful feedback that would make it a more educational program. So we're a little bit over time, my apologies, but let me see, I've got a question here about Paul says, and that's why we went with EcoStar Mad Majestic Slate, which is a, uh, yeah, that's a rubberized slate material. We actually have a uh, in our training room, a display of that uh, where it looks like slate, but it's made of old tires <laughs> and a lot easier to mount with uh, hail proof, he says, uh, and you can walk on it. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, it's it's a good product, Paul. I, I don't know how it does in fire classification. It may not be a class A fire rated product, but in the Northeast, that's not a big problem. Uh, Z Xavier asks if we have a solution for TPO roofs, which is a single ply membrane indeed. Xavier, you can check our training webinar on low slope mounting, and that would address uh, our low slope mount, which is the base and post, and then ways that that can be flashed with a TPO membrane flashing. Perry says, uh, nicely done. Thank you. Thank you, Perry. Thank you, everybody, for participating. I hope it was helpful. Uh, David says, can you comment on attaching the Cubase to 8.5 inch thick oh, SIP panels. So there's these roof types called structurally integrated uh, insulated panels. They're a laminated sandwich of foam and some, uh, well, it can be different materials, but usually some reinforcing boards and foam. Unfortunately, um, that's a bit of an advanced discussion, David. The general answer is SIP panels aren't well designed for solar roof attachments. That's the short answer. But the more involved answer is probably will take a little time. So you're more than welcome to reach out to me. Just email me your contact information. I can chat with you. But I would say that most of the time, uh, structurally insulated panels or SIP panels aren't well suited, sadly, to getting solar installed. And in fairness, SIP panels are usually done on the really... Uh, I guess you would call them lightweight structures or lower cost structures where solar is just not as common. So continuing on, let's see. Stuart says, uh, thanks, Jeff, from cold Alberta. <laughs> Burr, I'm in warm uh, Arizona. Uh, although my next door neighbors are uh, from Alberta. Uh, they live here only a few weeks a year, but I think they enjoy that time. This is about the time they're here. Siddharth says, very informative. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Quick Mount PV. Z Xavier says, cool. Thank you. And that is it, folks. That is the end of our presentation. Thanks again for participating. Have a wonderful weekend coming up, and we hope to see you at all at a future training event. Have a, have a good one. Adios.